Hi, I'm Jay Leeming, and this is the Crane Bag Podcast. Today we're going to create a universe, and our only tools will be darkness and silence. We're going to explore the Norse creation myth. Thank you for being here. Let us begin. First, there was only darkness, silence, a great hush. And this darkness had no limit, no beginning, and no end, for there was no time. But after a long time, time began to flow. There were beginnings and there were endings. And before long, that darkness had an edge. And that edge was cold. And in that cold, there was ice. And it had another edge. And that edge was fire. So slowly, over time, the fire crackled and burned and melted the ice. And the ice melted and froze, melted and froze. So strange shapes began to blossom in that darkness. Shapes like hunks of twisted mountains, tangled up rivers, bizarre flowers, glittering in the light of that burning fire. And each shape was like a thought the darkness had, as though it were trying things out. And then finally, the darkness settled on one particular shape. And this shape was that of a great giant. A frost giant, and his name was Ymir. So in the darkness, Ymir slept, and Ymir dreamed. And over time, two more frost giants grew out of Ymir's left armpit. Soon after that, Ymir's left leg fathered seven children on his right leg. And so the race of the frost giants was born. 
But also out of the ice there came a great cow. And this cow began to wander. And it wandered until it found a small hill. <clears throat> and with its great tongue it licked that hill until it found some hair. And it licked that hair until it found a head. And it licked that head until it found a body. And so out of the ice, Buri was born. And Buri took as his wife one of the frost giants grown out of Ymir's left arm. She gave birth to Bor, and Bor married Bestla, and she gave birth to three gods, Odin, Honir, and Lodur. And these gods had desires, they had ideas, they had a plan. So they began to make weapons out of the ice. Each of them fashioned a great spear out of the ice. And using the crackling fire and the bitter chill of that cold, they melted and froze these spears until they were extremely sharp. And then in the light of that great fire, they plunged these spears into the heart of Ymir. And he groaned and he died in his sleep. And they took his skull and they made the sky. And they took his bones and they made the hills and mountains. And they took his flesh, the meat of him, and they made the land. And his blood of itself flowed away and made rivers. And the rivers flowed and made oceans. And on that flowing, the frost giants were carried away. And angry in their hearts, they made a world of their own in one of the corners of the universe. thoughts of Ymir, and out of them he made clouds. And he called the land Middle Earth. And the clouds drifted over Middle Earth. And sometimes they brought rain. And sometimes they brought only shadows. And Odin, Honir, and Lodur wandered through Middle Earth. For it was a place they had made, but it was also a place that had been unleashed. The forces they had unleashed had made things, birds, roots, trees, rivers, boulders, and they did not know exactly what was there. So they wandered and explored. And they were walking along the shore, for they found that Middle Earth was bounded by a great sea. And they walked along that shore, Odin walking on the sand, Honir walking in the muddy, squelchy place, which was both wet and dry and Lodur walking in the water. And then they came to a piece of driftwood from a great ash tree. And Odin lifted it up and breathed into it. And Honir waved his hand three times over it. And Lodur said nine words of power over it. And the piece of driftwood opened its eyes and said, What am I? And Odin said, You are a man and put the man down on the ground. And then they walked further, and they found another piece of driftwood from a great ash tree. And Odin picked it up and breathed into it, 
and Honir waved his hand three times over it, and Lodur said nine words of power over it. And this piece of driftwood opened its eyes and said, What am I? And Odin said, You are a woman. And he put the woman down on the ground. And the man and the woman found each other and wandered off to explore Middle-earth. And Odin, Honir, and Lodur wandered off as well, walking away from the shore and across a field and then through a great forest, across rivers and valleys, and finally they saw something very large far ahead. They walked towards it. It was like a hurricane of bark and tree limbs. It was a still hurricane. It was a gigantic tree twisting and winding. It went far up, rooted deep in the earth, rooted perhaps in the realms of ice and of fire. It went far up through the heavens. It seemed the stars were entangled with its highest branches. And Odin named it Yggdrasil, Odin's horse. And he and Honir and Lodur took hold of it and began to climb. Like mountain climbers, they went up the side, struggling up, scraggling their way up the side of that tree, till finally they came to its highest branches. With Middle Earth far below, they came to the place of that tree, lit always by the sun. And there they decided to build a world. And they put hills and mountains there, and forests and fields and rivers and lakes and great stones. And they remembered the anger of the frost giants over what they had done to Ymir. So they built a huge wall around Asgard made of mountains. And in this wall they put a great watchtower. And a god came to live there. Heimdall was his name. Heimdall who has nine mothers. Heimdall who can see grass growing on mountains far away. And can hear wool growing on the back of a sheep. And other gods came as well. Thor and his wife Sif with the golden hair, Bragi, the god of song, Eden, the god of growing things. Bragi, the god of song, Eden, the goddess of growing things. And they all built their palaces and castles there in the land of Asgard. And Mimir came, the long man, and Loki came as well, he made himself a slinky little castle shack at the edge of Asgard. And Odin took the goddess Frigg for his wife, and the two of them built a great palace. And Odin built a huge tower in that palace, and at the top of that tower he put a chair, a mighty throne, and he chanted spells over it nine times, and then he sat in that chair. And he found that from that throne he could see out into all the nine worlds. And he looked also, and he saw that there was a rainbow bridge, a bridge of shimmering, shattering voltage between Middle-earth and Asgard. And he saw that there was a traveler on that bridge. It was a visitor the first visitor to Asgard. And she was a woman. And she had a wooden staff. And as Odin watched, she walked across that rainbow bridge. And he saw her come to Heimdall's tower there. And Heimdall spoke with her. And he nodded and opened the gates and let her through. So Odin descended the spiraling stair of his tower and crossed the grasses of Asgard and went to Gladysheim, the great hall the gods had built, where they all gathered often. And he went through the golden gates of that hall and he gave a command and a feast was prepared and an ox was roasted and mead was brought up from the cellars. And the candles were lit so that the golden spears on the walls of that hall glowed and sparkled. And at one end there was a great fireplace. And a huge fire was built in that fireplace. 
and all the gods assemble there. And across the grass she came walking, under the stars she came walking, from far away she came walking, and the gates of Gladysheim opened, and she welcomed, she walked into that hall, and she was welcomed there. Across the grasses she came walking, and from far away she came walking, and the doors of Gladysheim were opened, and she was welcomed there. And there was a great feast in that hall, and the mead flowed, and the food was good, and the candles were bright in everyone's eyes. And they laughed and they sang and they told stories the gods did and their visitor as well. And when they were filled with food and drink, when they were content in body and mind, the feast was over. It was twilight, orange beams of the setting sun were coming through the windows. And then Odin stood and he said, Dear traveler, be welcome here among us. For indeed, anyone who undertakes a journey undertakes a difficult task. So we offer you our hospitality. But also, I am wondering, what is your name? And why have you come here? And the woman stood up. She was wearing a blue cloak, and she had a staff inlaid with jewels. Her hat was a four-cornered red hat made of catskin, and her gloves were of black catskin as well. And there were two reindeer antlers dangling from her belt and a bag made from the skin of a cat. And she stood up and she said, I am Gulveig of the Vanir gods. I have come here to offer you prophecy. I will prophesy for you. Prophecy, said Bragi. I will look deep into the folds of this moment and see what seeds of possibility will flourish and which ones will wither and die. For I know the ancient art of Sather magic, and I bring it here to this place, this new hall, for you new gods. I will prophesy for you. If you prophesy me, I'll break your nose, said Thor. Is there anyone here who knows one of the old songs, said Gulveig? No one spoke. Don't prophesy for us, said Loki. We don't need your witch magic. Is there anyone here, she said, any woman here who knows one of the old songs? And Eden stood up and she said, I think I know some of one of the old songs. And so Eden, the goddess of all growing things, she began to sing. And her song was a green leaf and it was the power of a wave crashing against a shore. And her song was the wings of butterflies, and it was the song of stones underneath a river's weight. And it was a book with a thousand pages, and it was an apple on a branch in a tree rooted in silence and forever. And as she sang, all the gods were wrapped inside her song. And a mist seemed to fill that room and all the corners of that room. Nachain ein Asan, Nachayadia, No ne ne he, not you. Filachain a hind And 
as she spoke, Gulveg walked to the center of the room, and she took three sticks from her catskin bag, and she made a stool of these three sticks, and she sat upon it, and still, Gulveg, and still, Eden sang, the goddesses in the room moved to the center, Frigg and Nana and Sif, and they began to walk in a circle around Gulveg, as if they were casting a spell, as if they were under a spell. <laughs> Gulveg took a bag from her belt, and there were nine sticks inside it, and she threw them to the ground, and she looked at the pattern, and she chanted words over those sticks, and nine times she threw them down onto the floor, and each time she looked at the pattern, and she spoke a word. Goddesses moved back to their places. And Gulveg put the sticks back in their bag. And Eden stopped singing. And Gulveg stood there in the middle of the room. And she said, I have looked and I have seen. You are all going to die. You are gods, but you are gods that will die. We don't want to hear this, said Bragi. I have looked, I am telling you what I have seen, she said, that is all. This moment is a seed, it will flourish, it will sprout, it will become something else. Leaves and branches of moments will flourish in the air. Some of them are black, some of them are white, some are silver, gold, red, green. I see those colors, I see the shimmering music of those colors, and I can read the pattern. And I see that you are gods, but you are gods who will die. We don't need this, said Loki. Shut up, she said. I see a winter will come, a winter that will last three years. It will pummel Asgard and Middle-earth as well. It will pummel all the nine worlds with ice and with snow. These are not prophecies, said Loki. These are curses. If she speaks them, they will come true. She must be stopped. There will be a winter to last three years, and then fire will come. From Moose Spell, Surt, the fire demon, will be unleashed. He and his forces will storm the Rainbow Bridge. Fire will devour Asgard. I see the beams of this very hall. I see them turn to ash, floating on the wind, rising high up, obscuring the sun. And in that moment, a dagger came out of the shadows, and suddenly it was in her back, and she twisted and gasped. Thor seized his moment. He took hold of a great golden spear from the wall. He stepped forward. Forward, he thrust it through her body, twisted it, and pulled it out again. She fell, slumped to the floor, shattered that stool. The splinters went all over the floor. Everyone gasped. What have you done? said Frigg. Thor bent down. He picked up Gulveg's lifeless body and began to walk towards the fire. He is saving us, said Loki. He is saving us. And Thor went to the fire, and he placed Gulveg's body in that fire. And they gasped as they watched the flames devour her catskin bag and her cloak and the skin of her and the bones of her and her hair, all of it torched up, gusting away into light and ashes and smoke filled the room. And then, as they all stared into that fire, something in that fire began to move. And as 
they all watched something sat up in that fire. No, 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 no. And then out of the flames strode Gulveig herself. And her eyes were fire. But not that fire, they were the fire at the start of all things. And she went to the center of the room, and she said, I am one of the Vanir gods, the deathless ones, the gods of sleep and of darkness. And out of that sleep come the dreams of this world. And in that darkness there are stars that are cradled. We are the gods of spring, of the healing powers, of the green sprout that thunders its way up out of the darkness into light. We are ancient, we cannot be killed. I come, I bring you these powers, these gifts, and you slay me here and cast me into a fire. So you are gods who conquer and kill and take and torture. We are the gods of sleep and rejuvenation of the beauty of the spring. You will die by your means. You will live, but you will die also. I can see that you are gods who will die. And in that moment, again, a dagger came from the shadows and it was suddenly in her back. And Honir gave a great cry and rushed forward and he thrust a sword into her side and pulled it out, twisting it out. And she fell to the floor, lifeless, slumped on the floor. And there was no breath in her body and her heart was not beating and there was no light in her eyes. What are you doing, said Frigg? She is our guest. And Thor jumped forward, and he took hold of Gulveig, and again he walked towards the fire. He is saving us, said Loki. He is saving us. And again Thor put Gulveig's body in the fire. And again they watched as the flames devoured her clothes and her skin and her hair and the bones of her, all of it gusting up into light and to shadow and to ash and the smoke filled the room. And then again, something in that fire began to move. And again, something sat up in that fire. And Gulve walked out of that fire. And she came to the middle of the room. And again, fire smoldered in her eyes. And again, everyone looked at her in shock and dismay. <laughs> And Mimir this time rushed forward with a spear, and he killed her this time with that spear through her side. And he carried her to that fire, and he threw her into it, her lifeless body there. And again something moved in that fire. And again something sat up, and something walked from that fire. <laughs> And so she stood before them in the center of that hall with ashes in her hair, with a trail of embers beside her. And the gods stared. And she looked at all of them and she said, Enjoy what you have. And then she strode towards the doors of Gladysheim, and she flicked her hand, and without touching them, the doors opened, and she walked out into the starlit grasses of Asgard, and the doors slammed behind her. We must stop her, said Mimir. She is walking towards our death. What? said Frigg. Yes, Loki said. Yes, if she gets to the Vanir and tells them what we have done to her, there will be war. Odin stood up. Indeed, there will be war. We must follow her. So the gods grabbed their spears and their axes, and they went out through the doors of Gladysheim into the starlit grasses of Asgard. And they looked in all directions. The dark hummed above them. Heimdall came out. Heimdall, who can see grass growing on mountains far away, who can hear wool growing on the back of a sheep. He looked in all directions, but he did not see her. Where has that witch gone? said Loki. They looked and looked, but they did not see her.
They looked and looked, but they did not see her. And then a runner came from the gates of Asgard. Across the grasses he came, one of Heimdall's servants. And he came out of breath, and he said, Something, something is at the gates. What? said Honir. Something is at the gates. The gates, they're, they're, they're moving, they're pulsing. War is upon us, said Odin. Prepare yourselves. And as he said those words, the goddesses too stumbled out of Gladysheim. And Frigg put on a silver helmet and got on a white horse. And Eden grabbed a green spear and she got on a white horse as well. And shouldering their weapons, all the gods crossed the grasses of Asgard and walked towards the starlit mountains that were the wall around Asgard. And they came to the great gate made of granite. And it was true, the gate was pulsing and moving, bending like the beating of a great heart. Prepare yourselves, said Odin. And Thor flashed his axe around in a circle around him. And Frigg's hand tightened around her spear. And the nostrils of the horses flared and their eyes were wide. And suddenly, with a tremendous crash, that gate exploded in shards of shattered stone went in every direction. And they looked and they saw troops of the old gods there before them. And at their head was Njorth, the god of the sea, with a silver crown. And near him were his two children, Freya and Freyr, the lady of light and the lord of rain. And they were wearing green crowns, and they were on blue horses. And Njorth said, You have wronged us. We demand tribute. And Odin looked at them, and he gripped hard on his golden spear, and he said, here is your tribute! And he hurled it over their heads. And the, with a great roaring sound, the gods crashed together in a great combat. And spells threw through the air. There were icebergs hitting the sides of the walls of Asgard. And spears and arrows went flying. And spells of fire and a broken rock came tanging down from the sky. And the horses shrieked, and the stars themselves seemed to scream in agony, and the dark writhed and curled around that moment. And for eight days there was great war and combustion on every side. And soon Asgard was on fire, and soon Bragi and Mimir journeyed to Vanaheim and set fire to the kingdom of the Vanir gods. There was blue lightning in the air and green lightning as well. Holes in the ground, great rifts. Wolves made out of ghost-like silver went flying this way and that. Spells were cast. And after nine days, North and Odin squared off before the fortress of Thor, which was on fire. And they looked each other in the eyes. And each one saw every move the other would make. And around them whirled circles of the spells that they could cast. And for every spell, there was a counter spell. And in one moment, both of them threw down their spears. And Njorth said, let there be peace between us. And Odin said, yes, let there be peace. And they bellowed to all the other gods and goddesses, cease your fighting, let there be peace. And Njorth said, We must have the great bowl of peace from Vanaheim. And the god of rivers went to Vanaheim, and he returned with that bowl, a great silver bowl, and carved on the outside were branches and leaves and roots. And Njorth spat into that bowl, and Odin spat into it as well. The liquids from their bodies, the spittle of their bodies themselves, mingling to make one substance. And all the other gods and goddesses came, and they spit into that bowl as well. So the liquid of their bodies became one single substance, and the peace agreement was made firm. And then Odin cast a spell, and a gentle rain fell on Vanaheim, and put out all the fires that had been burning there. And Njorth cast a spell, cast a spell as well, and a gentle rain fell down on Asgard, and put out all the fires burning there. And when those rains had drifted away, the gods decided that they should mingle their numbers. So Honir and Mimir left Asgard and went to live in Vanaheim with the Vanir gods. And in Njorth, Freya, and Freyr, the Lady of Light and the Lord of Rain, they came to Asgard to live there. And as the sun went down, all the gods retired to their castles 
and palaces, and prepared to sleep. Odin and Frigg went to their castle, but there Frigg slept, but Odin did not, for he had brought with him the great bowl of peace. And he went to a round room of stone at the back of his palace, and he walked around that silver bowl of peace with the spittle of all the gods inside it, and he chanted spells for nine days and nine nights. Spells that rang in the air like bells, that were like the dreams of stones kept under hills for thousands of years. Spells like the darkness itself. And after nine days, he looked in that bowl, and there was a man there, curled up, sleeping. And as Odin watched him, the man opened his eyes. He awoke, and he stood up, and he stepped out of that bowl. And Odin asked him the first question that this man of answers would ever hear. And it was, who are you? And the man said, I am Kvasir, and I have the wisdom of all the Vanir gods and the Aesir gods within me. Question me. So for three days and three nights, Odin questioned Kvasir. And Odin's questions were branch and leaf. They were cloud and high wind blowing at the farthest reaches of the sky. And Kvasir's answers were root and darkness. They were stone and the long, lumbering thrill of the river underneath the mountain. And then Kvasir went to Gladysheim, and he spoke with all the gods there, and he answered all of their questions. And after that he wandered away and went to Jotunheimr, where the frost giants live, and then to the realm of the dwarves and the elves. And some say he even went to Muspel, the realm of fire, and spoke with the fire giants there. And in each realm he answered all the questions that he was asked. Finally he came to Middle-earth, where we, the humans, the two-leggeds, live with our coffee and our broken spoons. And he wandered among the villages in the countryside there, and he answered every question that he was asked. And one night he was sheltering at a farmhouse where a farmer and his wife and their two children lived a boy and a girl, and he sat by the fireplace, and they asked him questions. And the children said, where did the world come from? And are the mountains really the bones of a frost giant? And are the clouds really the thoughts of Ymir, that first frost giant? And why did the gods fight? And what did it lead to? And Kivasir answered all of their questions. And then they all prepared to sleep. The farmer stayed behind, and he put the bed, he put the fire to sleep. He put ashes over the embers of that fire. And he stood up, and Kvasir was beside him. And the farmer said, You know, I have one last question. How did the gods repair the wall around Asgard? And Kvasir looked into the distance, and he said, I don't know. And darkness covered the world, and the stars came out. And everyone in that farmhouse went to sleep. And in the morning the sun rose and filled Middle-earth with its light, and the birds sang their songs. And then Kvasir opened the door of that farmhouse, went outdoors, and began to walk. It was morning, and the light was beautiful on the grasses and on the trees. He marveled at all that he saw, the sparkling rivers, the distant mountains. So he walked for a long time, and over his head drifted the clouds. And sometimes those clouds brought rain, and sometimes they brought only shadows.
All right. Thanks for listening to this podcast. And so we begin with the Norse creation myth. So we begin with darkness. Darkness without opposites. Darkness complete in and of itself. And then we get opposition. Ice and fire. Ice and fire. I invite you to enter this story, to uh, listen to it uh, through my voice, but listen to it through your own feelings. Let it uh, go into you. Wander through it. Uh, I invite you to uh, turn off my voice if necessary. Am I supposed to say that? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that. Whatever. Pause my voice or whatever and see what images come to you. Uh, perhaps you've had a moment to do that already, but if not, consider doing it now. What sticks out from this story? It's like a dream we all just had, everyone who heard this story. And what do we remember now that we're awake? And what we remember is interesting. What we forget is interesting also. But I invite you to recall this story, all the pieces of it, and see what sparkles for you, what grabs you, what pokes you, what angers you, what buzzes for you. It's like a river, right? It's like a river, and there's something glimmering down there. And it is just for you and for no one else, even though it is a part of the river. And perhaps you can reach down into that cold water and pick it up and give it the warmth of your hands. And then the story will live as stories are meant to live in us and in our lives. So, yeah, darkness. We begin with darkness and then fire and ice. I like that beginning. I don't know. It's cool. I mean, it's just the simple opposites. Without opposites, nothing is created. Um, It's not simply... Uh, magic, divine magic, bang, there's a world. It's, uh, it begins in struggle, in conflict. And perhaps that is, that says something about where these stories are going to go. Perhaps not. Although I should be more accurate. It begins in peace and in that sleep, which is death and is chaos and contains everything, that darkness. But then we get opposition, fire and ice. And their struggle creates Something. What does it create? A frost giant, Ymir, and a cow. A giant and a cow. And then these gods show up. I mean, well, a lot of things happen. I don't mean to jump ahead. We get this crazy uh, multiplying of the frost giants out of Ymir's armpit. And we get the the wild detail of his left leg fathering children on his his right leg, which is kind of hilarious in a way. Um, But it is hilarious, right? But it also says something this this being Ymir is complete of himself right he doesn't need another to create something else he is just all he is one in the all I guess he is he contains the beginning and the ending more frost giants can come out of him he already contains a multitude do I contradict myself says Walt Whitman Whitman very well I contradict myself I am large I contain multitudes and so Ymir seems to contain multitudes and they spring up out of him women and men frost giants male and female and then we get the gods uh, the gods born after the cow licks uh, another frost giant out of the ice boar who then uh, marries and gives birth to Buri, Buri who marries Bestla and we get Odin Honir and Lodur who then promptly kill the frost giant. Bang! And the frost giants go off snarling and angry. The frost giants, to me, I don't know. This is why I'd love to hear what you think, and I'd love you to entertain your own thoughts. You know, ignore my thoughts if they do you no good, if they insult your soul in any way. You are completely free to do that, please. Um, But I would, for me, I'm feeling how the frost giants, they're like matter itself. They're like the stones and the trees. I mean, they make the world out of Ymir, right? So it's like matter itself is, is killed and made into the world. And, and nobody asked the permission of Ymir. Nobody gave an offering to Ymir. Nobody uh, praised him. Nobody gave him an offering and said, Lo, O oh great God, frost giant that you are, we wish to make a world. We request that we make it out of your great and powerful body. They don't do that. They simply kill him like that. So throughout, uh, my reaction through this is to see the 
conflict between the taking and the conquering that comes with these Norse gods and the world they're born into. Uh, and the world of sleep and darkness and regeneration, which will be expressed later in the story. And I'm reminded of stories I've heard. Uh, Martin Prechtel, the great teacher, who in his books uh, has talked about how in the village in Guatemala, where he lived for 15 years, you don't cut a stone until you have a dream about that stone. You sleep on that stone or near it for as long as it takes until you have a dream in which that stone grants its permission to be to be used by you, to be transformed by you into something that it could not have been without your skills and your hands. Uh, so there's an asking of permission. There's a transactional, there's a, a culture of offering, an economy of offering of spiritual gifts between this world and the other world, and simply in this world between us and the things we use. Here in the Norse mythology, there is no contract like that, it seems to me. Odin, Honir, and Lodur have a plan, and they kill Ymir just like that. Bang. Perhaps you're smelling parallels. You're seeing parallels with our own situation. Well, I certainly am. But let's leave them there for now. And then we get a world and we get these. I mean, there's a lot of great stuff. I don't know. I could, I mean, the driftwood that becomes the humans, the driftwood that is from an ash tree, which is great because later we find the ash tree, Yggdrasil, the great tree at the center of all things. Are they from that tree? Is, is that what humans are? Is driftwood from the great tree of life? Hello, driftwood. Hello, Driftwood. I am Driftwood. Are you Driftwood also? Yes, I am Driftwood, given breath, given thought, given desire by those three gods. I am Driftwood walking around. So we are, and we fell from the tree and were washed in the waters of the ocean, the salty waters. For we are salt in our blood and in our sweat, and on our skin we are salt as well as we are water. And we floated on those waters and we were given life. Is that what it is? Well, so it seems, possibly, in this story. And we climb up the tree, and the gods make their own world up there, Asgard, knowing, of course, that the frost giants are angry in their hearts and will always be angry, for they have committed a sort of a crime uh, against them by making the world. And they make their palaces. And, uh, yeah, so this story... You know, I mean, at first, Norse myth seems very cruel and bloody and violent, and in many ways it is. But the deeper I go into it, the more I see the beauty that is there, and the tragedy, and the sorrow, right? Because we know how this is going to end. Uh, spoiler alert, as we say these days. It soon becomes apparent that they're gods, but they are not going to be gods forever. And Gulveig shows up. I love her representing this, the forces of sleep and of darkness. So I hope you can find your way into this story, uh, possibly, either now or in the future if you keep it with you. Um, and I encourage you to react to it with your heart and mind in that way, with your dreams, whatever it takes, you know to live inside it and not treat it as a scholarly thing. We want the dust off of this thing, right? I mean, it's an old story. Not as old as some, but it's, you know, a couple thousand years old. We don't want to keep it on the shelf. We want to have it live uh, alive and jumping in us and in our hearts and in this world today. Because perhaps we need it. Perhaps we need it as a way to see what is around us, as a way to understand our world. But with all that said, I'm going to tell you a little bit of my journey with this story as a storyteller, um, more than I usually tell about a story. Because this one has some holes. Yeah, it's got some holes. The Norse stuff is incomplete in a way uh, that other traditions, well, many other traditions are not. Uh, Hindu mythology, for example, uh, fewer holes there. Norse mythology, our two main sources, are the prose Edda and the poetic Edda. There's a fellow named Snorri Sturlson, uh, Snorri, son of Sturl, who lived in Iceland about 1200. And he uh, did many things. He was a chieftain, he ruled over places, and he also wrote poetry. 
And at one point, he wrote down a treatise, uh, a book about how to write poetry. And in that book, he summarized a lot of myths that uh, a poet should know. And uh, so he didn't quite uh, tell them, didn't exactly tell them in poetry. He just summarized the details. That His book makes up about half of what we know about Norse mythology. And he refers to myths often that we have no other source for. Um, he refers to them as if everybody knew them, but we now, looking back uh, in the year 2020, uh, don't, don't have those sources. The other source for Norse myth, basically speaking, is the Poetic Edda, which is a collection of poems uh, which tell some of these stories. That is, many of those poems are older, uh, far older than Snorri's writing down of these, these myths, and uh, many of them are incomplete. They're missing parts, and uh, it doesn't form a complete picture. So all of this is to say that uh, fire, shadow, death, rot, uh, rust never sleeps. All these forces have had their way with the Norse mythology and Christianity. Let us not leave that out. Christianity, which uh, attempted to stomp these things out um, because they were pagan beliefs and they were uncool. Uh, that's for sure. So uh, there were many forces against the remembering of these stories. Uh, and nevertheless, here I am in 2020 telling you some of them, which is a kind of a triumph, I suppose. But uh, not to place any one mythology over the others, but just to say. But there's some holes. So to make a long story short, the whole story of uh, Gulveg showing up and the war between the Aesir gods and the Vanir gods is alluded to in Snorri, but not spelled out. Um, there's a whole story, which I will also tell at a later date, about the uh, building of the wall, the repairing of the wall around Asgard, because it was damaged in the war. But the actual war, we don't hear much about at all. So my main source in telling you this story here and now is a poem called Veluspa, which is found in the Poetic Edda, which basically says uh, this. It says a woman showed up at Asgard, she prophesied. The gods attempted to kill her three times. They failed. She was alive after each attempt. She left, and there was a war. That's it, pretty much. That's all we know. A lady shows up. She gives a prophecy. The gods attempt to kill her three times. They fail, and she leaves, and there's a war. So that's a big gap, right? That's a big hole. Like, how do we fill that? Well, you look around at other sources, and I've been looking with the help of other uh, folks in this world, uh, particularly I should mention Jackson Crawford, who has a terrific uh, cycle of YouTube videos about Norse myth, uh, as well as some other sources. There is an Icelandic saga in which a woman shows up and prophecies, and nobody wants her to prophesy, but she does nevertheless. Um, so there are two kinds of magic in Norse, in the Norse worldview. Uh, one of them is that, that most of the gods have. The other is a kind of magic called Sather, S-E-I-D with a little line through the D-R, Sather magic. This was known primarily by women, and it was the province of the Vanir gods, the gods of renewal and uh, fertility of which Freya and Freyr are two, and Njorth as well. So, and it also, and also Freya brings this art of Sather to the Vanir gods, to Odin and company. She teaches them this. And it's considered a woman's art. It's uncool for a man to know this art, to practice it. Odin does practice it, and it allows you to do things like change your shape. It allows you to see the future. It allows you to curse others and to take their powers away and to take them on for yourself. Um, and as I said, it's the province of women, uh, which is quite interesting and remarkable. Freya and Freyr, for their part, uh, the names of them really mean just lord and lady, which is quite suggestive. Um, so we have an older realm of gods, just like in Greek myth, and the Aesir gods, Odin, Thor, uh, Heimdall, people like that, uh, they uh, have a war with the Vanir gods, and chief among the Vanir gods are Njorth, god of the sea, and Freya and Freyr, lord and lady. So it, it, 
I'm reading into this as my job is as a storyteller and to flesh this out right now. And I'm thinking about the power of women in a society. And in this particular society where seeing the future was the province of, of women. So I haven't really added a ton to this story, but I have certainly accented certain things which felt right to me. And I'm also thinking of uh, Tacitus, who wrote about the Germanic tribes, Tacitus the Roman, and said, this is also thanks to Mr. Crawford, this little detail, he noticed that the women of the Germanic tribes, they determined if a war was to be fought, and they would do a divination, and they would give a verdict on if a war was to be fought or not. Um, so that's very interesting. And finally, I'll just say that I live in Ithaca, New York, upstate New York, which is the province of the, well, broadly speaking, the Iroquois, also known as the Haudenosaunee, which is more what they would like to be called. But in particular, in my case, I live in the territory of the Cayuga tribe, the Gaiokono, as they would like to be called, which was also matriarchal, where also the women would choose the chiefs. And there were chiefs who were men, but if they did something wrong, if they did something totally uncool, the women would, uh, de would get rid of that chief. Well, not get rid of, would, that man would be a chief no more, no longer. And war was also, at least in my understanding, uh, decided upon by the women as well. So why am I going into all this stuff when I'm telling you, Nora Smith? I'm just telling you where I'm coming from as a storyteller and what I have chosen to see in this story. Because as I say, there's some gaps which I have filled in. And given that, given that I have, I know these things about the matriarchal society that was here and that potentially the Germanic tribes had, uh, it makes a lot of sense to me that what happens is this woman, Golveg, comes and prophecies and tells them they're going to die. Because like I said, all we know is she comes and prophecies and they try to kill her. So why would they try to kill her? Clearly they don't like what she says is what I'm thinking. And uh, perhaps they think they're immortal, and she tells them they're not. So that's something I have chosen to add to this story. And there's the tree, by the way. You couldn't have failed to notice, again, the tree, Yggdrasil. Because we get a universe that is made by the gods, right? They kill Ymir, and they make a universe. But there's no mention of where the tree comes from. The tree is just always and forever. And later on, we find out that it will endure after the world is destroyed. Uh, so that's remarkable as well. So for me, I connect the Vanir gods with the tree and with the forces of, well, they clearly are connected with the forces of regeneration, of fertility. Freya is a goddess of love and of beauty. Freyr is the god who brings the rains that makes the crops grow. So, blah, 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 blah. not to bury you under talk, but um, I just wanted to let you know a little bit of where I'm coming from with this story and what I have done with it, because um, I have added to it, I've, I've uh, accented certain things more than I do in other stories, just because there are some missing pieces in this story. So there you are with that. And finally, I'll just say again where this takes me with this story and that is to what it is to be in a culture, in a world, a race, if I can use that word, uh, in this case, a bunch of gods who take and they conquer and they create, but they destroy at the same time. And I cannot help but think of our current situation, of course, uh, the sixth extinction in which we are involved, involving a huge die off of animals on this planet. Um, and how things seem bleak often, right? They seem kind of bleak. Uh, if you look at the environmental situation right now, well, I don't need to describe it perhaps for you. Um, but I, then I see folks like Odin, who throughout these stories will continue to try to fight to preserve things, knowing as he does that it will all end in fire and death, nevertheless. He, he, nevertheless, he persisted. Nevertheless, he persists and she persists. Of course, the goddesses persist as well. So I get that from this story, right? This, um, this knowledge that things will end. Death comes to us individually and perhaps to us as a species, perhaps to us as uh, a culture. But nevertheless, he tries to preserve what can be preserved. 
That's what I think about when I see the news. I don't know how it is with you, especially uh, fires, you know, rampant bad news. I think to myself, well, what do we want to save? That's the most important thing. What do we want to save? And then find out what that is for you and uh, find a way to give that to children. That's basically the story. So that's where my head goes with this apocalyptic beginning of this story. <laughs> and um, I uh, thank you for listening to it. And I hope you find your own nooks and crannies there in it. It's great, huh? Thor. I'll break your nose. That's a detail also from an Icelandic saga. It's not Thor. It's another character who says that. But he threatens to break the woman's nose if she prophesies. And nevertheless, she prophesies. And life goes on from there. And that's another story. And then we get these wild details of the man made from the spit of the gods, right? And uh, wow, what a wild, weird thing. And I'm reminded of the story in, that Carl Jung tells about being in Africa, about folks who would spit on their palms and, and offer it up to the sun god, uh, offering up their soul, the spit, which is <clears throat> their individual thing, which is their essence uh, to the gods. So uh, we tend to think of spit as, you spit, you get rid of it, you curse something by spitting on it. But... Um, in a way, perhaps this is the very essence of those gods preserved. Perhaps there is some respect there as they uh, spit into this silver bowl and make the man, Kvasir, who answers all the questions in such a lovely way. Thank you for listening to this story and uh, th to this podcast. Uh, many thanks to the Patreon supporters uh, who make this possible. Um, I try to offer as many of these stories <clears throat> for free as possible to get them out there into the world because that's where I think they need to run around. And um, thank you to all of you who've made that possible. If you're able to join them, please do so. Every little bit of uh, inspiration and stuff like that uh, helps to fund this thing, because you have to pay for hosting and stuff like that in this frost giant world in which we live. Um, thanks so much. And uh, yeah, may this story uh, sing in us as it is meant to sing. And may the song be different for each of us. And may it uh, teach us something we perhaps thought we knew but didn't quite know. Take care and all the best. <laughs>